All right, welcome. Hey, Stanton, how are you doing? Good to see you in this uh, snowy climate. So we couldn't help but uh, start off with an opinion piece in the New York Times. And actually, if you click to the Times website, it was right there on the on the front, you know, whatever you call it, home on the page. website, on the homepage, yeah. <clears throat> there was this piece by uh, Carl Eric Fisher. Actually, you, you dug up a nice excerpt from it. So I'm going to read this, and um, I've just been seeing it make its way through, like, the Twitter sphere, uh, Facebook, and Reddit, all these places where people have discussions about it. There have been a variety of reactions. So I want to share some of those and share mine. But the the gist of this piece is this guy, and correct me if you think there's more to add, but there's this guy that is finally saying after a long, uh, after thinking about it for a long time, that thinking about addiction as a disease is actually more harmful then it is helpful. And he says, addiction as a disease made sense to me initially, but before long, I realized how harmful that was. My very idea of addiction was working against me. I thought addiction was an extreme mental illness, a disease, as I learned in medical school and later in rehab. I understood addiction as a damaged condition that neatly divided me from the normal population. Descriptions of brain disease imply that people have no capacity for choice or self-control. Today, amid the overdose, opioid overdose epidemic, addiction is more likely to be called a disease, but the language of disease has not done away with the misleading notion that drugs hold all the power. We cannot end it, we certainly cannot cure it, and medicine alone will never save us. But if we drop the idea of disease and open up to a fuller picture of addiction, it will allow for a more nuanced care and compassion and, and he's uh, a uh, addiction a medical doctor and he's a member of whatever the association of uh, addictive uh, medicine so of course this is always my first reaction to pieces like these like um i mean even mark lewis um neuroscientist piece in the scientific american and things like that i read it and i think i look for the citation uh for your to your work <laughs> and it's never there but there's, um, of course, this is an opinion piece, so you know he doesn't doesn't require that he puts in uh, citations or name people that he learned this from. Um, but then I, you know, I have this sort of dialectic in my mind where I think, you know, it's the people who have been saying this for 50 years, like you, need some credit. And on the other hand, I should be glad that somebody, like, is writing for a publication like the New York Times that's been you know, anti, you know, it's been pro disease model for so long and publishes all these articles talking about how addiction is a disease. Um, You know, I'm happy to see that somebody is speaking commonsensically and talking like this in that paper. Um, I've seen, I've heard mixed things about this. You know, some people who are, um, who are long on the disease side of things who say that, you know, addiction should be classified as a disease because then you get treatment. And it sparked very interesting conversations that, you know, you've had in your books that you've had with people and that we've been having for a long time about, um, you know, okay, addiction, calling addiction a disease, okay, that gets you treatment, but what is treatment? You know, what does that mean? Does it actually help people? And this person, Carl Eric Fisher is saying, it's kind of what you do. It's like, well, how are we doing with that? And I think that that's um, I think that's an interesting concept. Now, the the uh, push and pull that I have with myself of that it matters that you and others who have come before him get credit for some of these ideas versus who cares if anybody gets the credit. Um, it's good that these ideas are getting out there. You have you have more thoughts on that. Like I, you could look at this and say it looks like the tide is turning, and then on the other hand. You could have a million of these opinion pieces, but the tide won't turn. And you have sort of an interesting history, you know, people that you've interacted with and reasons for believing that um, even though this is good news, this is a good sign that it's not necessarily going to sway people who have been deep in disease culture for a long time. And so hopefully you'll expand on that. Well, I don't think uh, I, I, you're going through my own thought processes. I mean, uh, There was an outburst of non-disease expression, of course, starting with Johan Hari, Mm -hmm. going back a few years, and then Mark Lewis. 
And, you know, for I wrote Love and Addiction in 75 and The Meaning of Addiction in 85 and Diseasing of America in 89. And, you know, I was discouraged that the disease model would always be totally dominant, not even the number one thing, but rule everything else out. And then all of a sudden there was a flood. The dam burst and a bunch of things came out. And of course, I was, you know, the fact that Johan Hari, who has told me that love and addiction was so significant to him, you know, would never mention my name in writing or in speaking, depressed me. Um, <clears throat> but you went through the logic. I mean, it is good that these ideas are finally coming to the fore. And then the question becomes, well, what's that mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are they going to change anything? Is the Surgeon General, who you know, the current Surgeon General was Obama was a uh, Obama Surgeon General, and he felt it he had to roll out a whole you know recognizing addiction as a disease thing, as though you know we need more of that. <clears throat> Will he ever? And he actually, in his off period, wrote a book. Mm -hmm which was called something like Community is Solution. I forget the right. title of it. Right. <clears throat> it's sort of like, um, you know, Robert McNamara. Well, I mentioned I started teaching at the Harvard Business School when I was 25. <laughs> and the last guy to do that, the last person was Robert McNamara, who was the secretary. He was the head of the Ford Motor Company and the secretary of defense. And he ran the Vietnam War. And then when he stopped being secretary of defense, he said, what a crappy war. You know what hmm. I mean? So, uh, you know, now the guy's back in his job and there's the inertia for keeping the disease model is so great. We won't expect to see some radical change. But as you said, there have been a million disease pieces about how great it is for addiction to be a disease in the Times, in Time and Light and Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine and Scientific American and Science. And all of a sudden, there's certainly a wellspring of material going the opposite direction. And so it, it's, it's certainly become kosher to talk about it, um, how it, it'll require a whole change of American attitudes. And, and more than that, as I think I'm going to get into, there's a gigantic inertial industry that's either going to be hard to, br to bring along or is going to kind of blurb it up in a certain way that w w what, w what results actually be different? That's a big the, discussion. The problem is, of course, you get this God out of the gaps thing all the way down. So you, you don't call it a disease maybe, but then there's always something that pops up that is kind of like disease-like that's sort of, puts drugs at the at the center of things that puts brain chemistry at the forefront of the issue it's like people can't a disorder that has to be treated yeah um, as opposed to right. the big step going out which is it's a part of the realm of ordinary human behavior mm. which is a hard radical departure to get to um <clears throat> you know i hopefully have a piece coming out about that i i'm working on it you know um I, I think it's going to lay out the options. So here's one reaction. Do you, do you know Bridie Tulloch? Is, that doesn't sound like an American exactly. Do you know that person? No. So um, Bridie Tulloch wrote about the, uh, it was one of the millions of com many comments. I agree that it's very deterministic view that is dishonest in respect that neglects the social, environmental, and familial factors all too often presenting with those experiencing problematic drug use, substance use. It blames the person rather than the wider society and is definitely harmful. It's also not evidence-based. I'm really hopeful that we are moving away from this. That's the discussion that we've been having, but fear that the abstinence-based recovery is becoming very ingrained in the field. Do you have the same reaction that I have to um, that last phrase is becoming very ingrained in the field um let me see so he's saying that that's his fear is that this uh the idea of recovery and absence-based recovery 
is becoming ingrained in the well when it, what does it mean becoming <laughs> is that your reaction I, I don't know where bridey has been but you know <clears throat> that up that it's been around for 50 or 60 years. <laughs> right. He's right. coming into the game. So anyhow, um, I, I, I've been writing about this for 50 and more years. I wrote a piece called What a Treatment. And, and you brought up the question. Okay, we provide treatment in the life process program. And what are we treating? We're treating people's overall life condition. And not only don't we call addiction a disease, we don't, you know, we get them, we're trying to decondition people from thinking of addiction as a disease or even thinking of addiction as a thing. We're saying, well, let's look at your overall life and let's see how drugs or sex or eating plugs into that. Let's take an overall view. And so um, I wrote a piece in the 80s, what a treatment for addiction can do and what it can't, what treatment for addiction should do and what it shouldn't. And the fundamental thing that treatment needs to do is to allow people to open their lives up, to get more satisfaction from life, to be more tolerant of themselves and, and their condition, uh, to get a greater spread of community. And the most important thing it needs to do is to enhance people's sense of their strength. And my argument is that treatment as it's currently conceptualized and practiced in large part does the opposite of all that. The disease theory works against a single thing psychology has shown to undergird change, your belief in your capacity to control your life. So <clears throat> enter all of this, I, I sent that article out by, uh, you use his initials, Carl Eric Fisher, who maybe he's never heard of me, like uh, Nora Volko. And uh, I sent it out to a list of people, and you were on that list. And somebody named William Cope Moyers is on the list. William Cope Moyers is the Vice President of Public Affairs for Hazel and Betty Ford. <clears throat> and you might wonder, well, how did I happen to be on a mailing <laughs> list with William Cope Moyers? And, you know, I'll just do a little digression into my memoir. Um, I used to live in Morris County. Um, which is one of the five richest counties, I think, in the country. And William Moyers, Bill Moyers, who's a famous public broadcasting person, lived there in Bernardsville, I think. And acro across the street road from me, we didn't have streets where I lived in Morris Township, uh, was a man named John Pascatano and his wife. And his wife happened to be the daughter of Bill Moyers. So John Pazicatano and I used to hang out. And one thing we used to do, we used to, at the top of our block, Morristown had a reservoir that was disused. And John and I used to swim in it. So we were, you know, pretty good buddies. And in that, sometime in that period, um, uh, Maya Salovitz was just rising from her former addiction. And she was somehow a producer of Bill Moyers, had a 1998 documentary uh, series for public broadcasting, um, you know, called Addiction in the Family. And it was straight disease bullshit. But it did that odd, strange thing of combine what they always do, combining AA <clears throat> and mm -hmm. brain imagery. Like somehow those two things fit together. And so Maya was nice enough to get me invited. And, you know, Bill Moyers, despite my being friends with his daughter, treated me like shit. You know, you'd see he was just completely ignored me because he wanted to do that straight disease thing. So years later, somehow William Cope Moyers got in touch with me and said, oh, I'm trying to branch out. And I said, you know, I'm, I, used, I was a friend of your sister and brother-in-law's. And he goes, huh, I mean, that's a strange, of all the things in the world, you know, that should happen. They're divorced now. So um, I sent this to him, and this is how he responded. I realize now that as a follow the debate of addiction as a disease or an illness or a behavior or a moral challenge or a criminal justice issue. To each his own, or own, I say. And he says, yeah, I was really impressed with that article, but that's bullshit. 
I wrote. So let's, back, so let's back up. So he's saying, at, at the head of his response to you, he says, that very impressive article, important article. And then he says, it's just like we're just spinning our wheels trying to debate if addiction is a disease or an illness or a behavior, whatever, it, criminal justice, whatever it is. Everyone just needs to believe what, what they believe, which is an As interesting far, statement. In the past, there, he was on the addiction <clears throat> network list. He said something similar. This is a, maybe three or four years ago. And, uh, you know, Nick Heather and I disagreed. So at least, you know, Moyers is supposedly saying, oh, well, that's a possibility. And I wrote back to William. He, his father's name, Bill Moyers, his name, William Cope Moyers. So he goes by William. William, that won't cut it. Fisher in the Times doesn't say call it a disease or not. It's fine. He says that the disease theory is in itself destructive because it misses the social determinants of addiction and recovery by regarding and treating addiction as a medical disease. It convinces people that they have no control over the addictions. The piece was kind of decisive. I mean, the piece didn't say, hey, the, the title is wrong. The title says, well, maybe addiction is not a disease. He says. It's harmful. It's hurtful. It goes the wrong way. It wasn't the way I needed to go. And, oh, he was addicted. He's an addiction medicine specialist now. But he, I, he what was his thing? I, I think he. Was he on, he was on some kind of speed and alcohol, maybe, I, th I forget. <clears throat> and I wrote to William, you should really read my memoir, um, which discusses you and your family. That story I just told is in there. Deprives people the most critical ingredient in recovery, their sense of their own power to change. And before we were discussing, well, how can therapy be helpful? And the most important thing therapy can do, and this, I nod my cap to Bill Miller, who's on the list, who's on my little mailing list, and self-efficacy is the critical element, your belief. Mm -hmm. And that goes all the way back to, you know, cognitive behavior therapy. That's what cognitive behavior therapy says. You know, we have a lot of fancy techniques and we have to influence thinking, but the single most important ingredient <clears throat> is people's belief that they control your lives. That's what you're looking for in life. You know, the, the, um, the idea all the time, this is kind of what Archie was saying, people's response sometimes to have been a disease proponents of the disease model. And they say, all right, you can have that view. It's not a disease. Maybe it's harmful. It, it's sort of like saying, um, well, the disease thing, that's a metaphor anyway. Who cares what we call it? It's just, let's just treat it. And um, somebody that I'm close to, you know, I just won't mention their name was saying in response to this, was saying, um, can you imagine if there was a, a medicine that was actually just a sugar pill, it was just a placebo, and you gave it to people and said it was curing them, at some level, you, you can't ethically tell them that it is something. I mean, even if it's a placebo, you have to tell them it's a placebo. You have to tell them that they are actually doing the work. It's the same sort of a thing. You, if this really is a metaphor, the disease is just a metaphor and who cares what you call it, then you have to grapple with the fact that it's the individual's who are undergoing this phenomenon, who are going to be doing the work, getting themselves out of it. By the way, they, Charles O'Brien and his group of Penn did that, what you just described, study with naltrexone. Mm. Zebo and naltrexone were identical in terms of their impact on reducing drinking. And the very concept of disease carries with it. By the way, the last time I was at a, um, you were at the last drug policy a law and DPA conference. I was at the one before that. And um, Maya and um, Pat Denning was on the podium. And Maya said, well, it's not really a disease, blah, blah, blah. It's a disorder. And I have Pat Denning, she, she comes out pretty close. She says, you know, I, I don't care if you call it a disorder or a disease. That's not, that's not the issue that we're dealing with. And, and she pretty much said, you know, we're dealing, it's something that most people outgrow. Most people that use substances don't become addicted. They become addicted to other things. And most people outgrow it. That, that's not a disease. It's, it's nothing. It's not nothing in the fact that people don't become addicted to things. But it's just not an entity that you can plant in space mm. and treat as an entity. So that's going the other way. That's saying, who cares what you call it? Let's focus on 
the underlying true factors of what what causes it and what it means and you know how to really help people. And I think and Pat Denning goes one step further in the direction of saying, you know, if you look at the array of people in the world, people are using a ton of things. They're trying to live their lives. Um, our job is to help them do that. We're a little bit aware, we're specialists in drugs and alcohol and addiction, how those things impose themselves. But part of what we're doing is defusing that and saying, well, let's take that out of the equation and look at your life and what's going to make it better. And that's that's a radical version of harm reduction. That version of harm reduction doesn't say, oh, we can give you, uh, you know, naltrexone or buprenorphine to help you, cure you. It says, let's just look at your overall life and how your drug use fits into that. And we're not going to put it down. We're not going to uh, remove you from it. We're just going to say, what's going to be the best way for you that you feel get you through life? Because mm -hmm. people have to do that. In San Francisco they're, and the Bay Area, they're dealing with a, probably a, a little down the pike population compared to say what, um, you know, uh, Andrew Tatarski is dealing with in the Upper East Side of New Manhattan. And they're, they've got the guts to sit it out and deal with people in that aversion. So I wrote, finally, William, I see no real change in your thinking over the decades. And here's where I get a little radical. And the views you continue to spread are killing people. You think I go too far in that, uh, saying that? Well, you're speaking the truth. You have more guts than I do. So I'm sitting here and saying, oh, it doesn't matter what you call it. Sure, we'll put them in Hazleton. And, I, do you, and, I'm, and of course, Hazleton and, 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 and William Coke, you know, uh, What's his father's name, Bill? What's the family name? Um, I forgot. Oh, William, Moyer. William Moyers is one of the people that's saying, oh, addiction is getting worse than ever. We're, I'm going to discuss that. Um, so I actually do an advertisement for Maya. Since Maya knew her father, and she brought me into that 1998 production, I say, do you know Maya? She, despite my friendship with your sister and brother-in-law, introduced me to your father. I am listed as a consultant on his PBS special. There's nothing in that special coming from me. Bill totally dissed me, par for those in the disease camp. She's also traveled between the recovery and harm reduction, self-empowerment worlds. <laughs> Warning, she drinks wine now. I don't think. <laughs> That's not Hazleton appropriate. Right. Maya agrees with me, both at you, both me and you. Me, the 12-step powerless now is destructive. You, rehab is good, helpful. You know, he's still pushing that whole thing. I mean, he does, you can look on the uh, YouTube. He's got videos. You know, being addicted is not just like da-da-da. It's not just like having a bad habit. It's like something that totally controls your entire life, which what apparently was true for him for a period of time. God bless him. Um, and it's not now. So, I mean, the, you ask if you're, you're asking sort of in jest, is your response uh, too harsh? But, you know, it is what it is. I mean, he's saying, well, who cares what you call it? Let's just, you know, let's push this under the rug. And you say, no, it matters what you call it. And in fact, it matters what you call it. It matters what you call it. And the thing you're calling it and the way that you're treating it actually is contributing to the death count. And shouldn't we be worried about that? And I'm I mean, going to talk about that, you know, and he's pushing it. So he's like, oh, Stan, I'm, you know, you knew my sister. Uh, let's reach across the bar barrier. <laughs> and he's had this line forever. At one point, Ethan told me, oh, I'm talking with, you know, the head of Hazleton's public relations. And he's open to this. It's it's meaningless. It's bullshit. So um, I, my view of this Maybe there's something wrong with me. I view this as a giant fraud that's been perpetrated on America. <clears throat> I mean, I believe that virtually people who know it's not true, people whose own lives have gone in a different direction, 
um, can't be made to see this. And it's because we've been drummed and pounded in our brains um, with these ideas. So I think of it, I, the disease series of Freud perpetrated in America. And unfortunately, I believe Americans, we were predisposed to believe this, but we could be convinced of anything. And so I, you know, um, I go, public broadcasting, the government's done the worst damage on this. I might sound like I'm a trumpet by this point. Richard Rustak wrote the best fellows, the brain and the mind. They were just straight down the road. This is in the eighties. Look, your brain makes you mentally ill. Your brain makes you addicted. It was just like, you know, taffy pull addiction, uh, addiction disease. Alan Leshner was the head of the NIDA before Nora Volko in 1997 wrote in science, science, <clears throat> Addiction is a brain disease and it matters. In 1998, at Bill Moyer's addiction close to home, and he did that shtick where he combines, you know, AA and brain disease theory, which is just a non sequitur, non starter. And then in 2007, HBO launched a heavily promoted multi-part series addiction in collaboration with Volco. And just to make sure people didn't forget by the next decade in 2018, recently the highly regarded PBS science program Nova did another brain disease primer series called addiction to explain the opioids crisis. And both HBO and the Nova series are turned into secondary school curricula. So, <clears throat> The funny thing is, you know, people didn't have to be convinced to take penicillin. You know what I mean? They said, um, you know, when you get an infection, you can die. And when you got a drug, it'll stop you from dying. But they have to drum home the idea of addiction. Is Why? Why won't people accept it? And it's always presented as like, oh, what a modern, great, a miracle discovery mm -hmm. we've made. Look, here's a picture of a brain. So, you know, uh, Bridey Tullock, I hope someday Bridey reaches out and he's worried, um, or she, is becoming very ingrained, in, that is becoming ingrained in the field. So it's been in the field, it's being driven home. And, you know, in 2020, Andrew Zimmern, is a famous modernist chef. And so um, he did a four part series on food in America. And, and a lot of it was really great. Like one is how we use Latinx people to uh, do our food. And then it was about processing and animals. And then he did one on addiction. And I was just sitting there watching it. I thought I was like in a dream state. Um, <clears throat> and so this is in 2020, and he went, he visited Hazleton, and he interviewed William Moyers, and uh, Zimmern's in recovery. And so he talked about, well, you know, AA is so great, the 12 steps are so great. And then he went to some, they always do this, they went to some lab at the University of Minnesota, and they have the pictures of brain scans and they say pretty soon we'll know what addiction is right in brain exactly exactly the same bullshit that bill moyers propagated 23 years ago with the same cast of characters bill moyers son somebody looking at a brain scan on television or on a uh, on a cbt or on a screen and the basic question is, and, and, and throughout the program, they're saying addiction is worse than ever, which we know about. Everybody's talking about the 100,000 per annum death level now. It's been rising steadily since the turn of the century, right after um, the Bill Moyers cockamamie special and Alan Leshner's article in Science, and right before... In 2003, Nora Volko became head of the NIDA, and nobody's worried about that. And what's the logic? How kooky can people be to say, we discovered addiction was a brain disease, 
And it was really driven home, like a great special by Bill Moyers and Alan Leshner. Oh, by the way, the number of drug deaths has quintupled um, since then. Um, and we're, we're approaching close to a million drug deaths since the year 1999, you know, right around, right after Bill Moyer's special. Can we never be made to see that we're going in the wrong direction? And so that's, that's the issue. And William Moyer is sort of jauntily walking along and saying with Zimmern, oh, we've got this great discovery. It's a disease, join AA for starters, Hazelton and 12 Steps, but they're going to discover a brain cure. They can come up with that rabbit out of a hat now and forever. They've been doing, and Zimmer's sort of a real with it kind of a guy. And that gets back to answering the question, um, is there going to be real change? It's certainly not going to be led, the real change isn't going to be led by William Coke Moyers. And so part of my, you know, part of my letter response to him was maybe a little snarky. Um, I, I, I said, uh, he's gotten, he got recovered. You should read my memoir with, about you and your family. It deprives people of the most critical ingredient and it, social determinants because the main victims are deprived whites and inner city blacks who can't provide your family's protective encasement. You know, so I don't, you know, I knew a little bit. I knew about William Coe Morris before I met him because I knew his sister. And, you know, he went through a tough period and he had to be rescued a lot by his father. And those are really bad things. Those are dangerous things. And then he got a job at Hazleton, and now he's a regular middle class, well off person. All of that other baggage, that social baggage, why would that bother him? It, it's just not part of his world or his bailiwick. So he ignores it. So I just feel this radical urge to, you know, call BS on all of these people and to say, um, and to welcome Fisher's article. And say, thank God it's got to the, the homepage of the New York Times. At least there's some kind of critical mass might be too strong a term for it. At, at least we're starting a snowball down a hill. And, you know, maybe it's going to lead somewhere. And when that happens, you know, I hope they dig my name out of the snow. You know, a couple of people are trying to do that. Nick Heather, and who, who you know, in my memoir... I quote him saying, you know, when we come up with a more sane and sensible way of looking at the disease theory, here, I'll read it. I put it on the cover of my book. Well, I'll kind of here too. Baya, Stan Peel is one of the most insightful thinkers about addiction anywhere ever. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. That's recover. That's, uh, that's Johan Hari. Um, yeah, this one is, uh, here's the one with Nick Heather. Stanton Peel has done as much as anyone to reveal the inadequacies, absurdities, and injustices of the idea that addiction is a disease, and specifically that it's a disease of the brain. In a constant flow of inf influential books, articles, and blogs over more than 40 years, he has persuasively extended the critique of the disease theory of addiction beyond the scientific community to the general public. When the disease theory is eventually replaced by a more rational and humane approach in the popular understanding of addiction, Stanton Peel will be first in line to receive uh, plaudits. And those of us who broadly share his view will owe him profound debt of gratitude. God bless Nick. So what, what are your, what final reactions do you have to, well, this Fisher article came out, the homepage, people are having different reactions to it. You know, and they're, they're more or less the same range of reactions. And people say, well, it doesn't matter what you call it. And, you know, led by William Cope Moyers. And, you know, people are still dragging their heels. How do you react to this whole can of worms? You're a little younger than me. You're going to be around a little longer, maybe, as this plays itself out. 
something has to get people excited about the the reality of real life people the understanding that the the range of of experiences that a person can have that are going to be completely different than their own than the the milieu that they've adapted to so it's not even um you know unlike your friend who says who cares what you call it you know i like i would say that i like this this times opinion piece i enjoy that it's a person who has experienced something and says you know now i'm looking around and i'm tasked with helping people and i can't ethically say that you know, basing this in some disease framework is going to help people. Actually, I think this might be going the totally the wrong direction. So he was energized by something real. And I think that that is the key. I mean, I don't know if that's possible, but people need to be energized by something real. Now Even I, when- I always try to draw people in. You saw my speech in Washington where I say, well, how many of you have taken a painkiller and how many became mm -hmm. addicted? Nobody is. And of course, I mean, I became semi-famous when I wrote Love and Addiction. I said relationships can be addictive. Um, and then I described the ex uh, experiential model of addiction, where something becomes so all-consuming and you believe it's so essential to your well-being, and it becomes a central focus in your life, but it's destructive. Yeah. And right before this article, Maya Salovitz wrote an article for New York Times where love is, I actually wrote an article, Mia Archie and I wrote an article for Psychology Today called um, Love, Interpersonal Heroin. And she said, her title was something like that. Love is so, uh, uh, you know, drugs, addiction is, and drugs are so powerful because they feel like love. And she describes the experience of being enmeshed in a love relationship as being as all encompassing as the, uh, opioid bubble that surrounds you, you know, when you get stoned on a hard, you know, hard line. I don't, I don't want to use the word hard line. When you, you know, a major league experience changer, like a narcotic. And as she's often, read the read what uh, Maya said at the top of the front page of my book. Oh, you do have Maya's on the front page. Stanton Peel is a true pioneer of addiction research and theory. His ideas must be reckoned with by anyone who is serious about understanding addiction. And she did the recent article in the New York Times without mentioning my name. <laughs> That's true. Good point. But she describes <laughs> Johan Hari as the guy, well, he talks about love as being the opposite of addiction. So, well, that's so what I like about your exercise is. You take care. There's a there's a natural way that people sort of compartmentalize their understanding of what addiction is. There's a camp. I'm not telling you anything new. I'm just uh, reflecting. Yeah, there's a camp that says addiction. That's nothing. There is no addiction. You know, people have choices, and that's all there is. Okay, you kind of tackle that by saying, "Hey, have you ever had this involvement that's supposed to be addictive? Whatever, painkiller, smoking. Are you still addicted to it? Oh no, nobody is. So that's sort of the. Can't you see? You just sort of. It's almost like you had a bad week or something, and then you, you grew out of it. You didn't even think about it. But there's something more to that. There's a phenomenological thing there. That addiction's not a thing, but there's a phenomenon. And you get you can explain you greater explaining to people. Um, now let's think about this thing that could be all consuming to you or a loved one, and what it, people have done in the name of this relationship that they formed and things that they have or have neglected to do that they should have done. And that, that sort of pulls on the heartstrings a little bit, but it stays in the realm of, it stays in reality. And you can st you get people thinking about, you know, Oh yeah, I do have a loved one that was like this and you don't have to create anything fanciful around it. Maya's article, you don't, I don't talk bad about people very often. You know, I, I like to see people contributing and I'm not trying to talk bad about Maya, but just the idea I had a problem with her saying that addiction is like love. You know, she, she made that mistake. And that's one of those things that, you know, Jacob Solom did that too, when he and I were talking and it's, that's the wrong way to think about it. I know you've discussed love being like a drug, but we'd say, you know, Oh man, you have a, the original there. But love so the, addiction, the juxtaposition seems strange yet. It shouldn't. For addiction may have as much to do with love as with drugs. Many of us are addicts and don't know it. 
And this loving addiction is just as self-destructive and far more prevalent than other more widely recognized ones. But then I say, ideally, in fact, love and addiction are actual polar opposites. Of course, you become you become uh, totally engulfed by this yearning to feel something like love or what lo- what love could a proxy for love, you know, just like you you're trying to feel well doing heroin, but you actually can't. Oftentimes people who are addicted, you can't balance that with your everyday lifestyle. It's just so practical. People can't get their arms around it. They need to create something fanciful, you know, something that's linguistically interesting. And um, we have to get away from that if that's ever really going to make any progress. So, well, you know, my biggest sales day was writing Love and Addiction, which a lot of people found strange to start with. It got popular, but then it got transformed. And they started forming AA groups, Sex and Love Addiction Addicts uh, Anonymous. It got plugged into the disease marketplace and conceptualization because that's the way we right. think of all kinds of addictions right so we have two columns one column says you know you know a lot of people take painkillers and don't become addicted um you know people get in the most destructive possible relationships and they call it love or they'll do anything to perpetuate this kind of feeling which maya described in her own life what's that called What's that about? It's addiction. Um, and uh, Fisher makes this point. Prior to the modern medical era, people didn't have a special category for drug addiction. You know, they said, well, people get meshed in a really destructive habit. It could be in tobacco. It could be alcohol. They, in the 19th century, they didn't think of opioids as a special problem. But they did talk about relationships. They did talk about food. They put them all in a giant broad category. And in a large way, what we're doing and what Carl Hart is doing is returning the concept of addiction to a general, non-specialized, non-specific medical syndrome, but as a general problem of life. So I'd like to encourage people to, in the comment section here, this is something I don't do enough um, for our YouTube video or for the podcast, the audio podcast. Um, insofar as there are comment sections there, discuss what you think about this article. You know, is it is it actually uh, something revolutionary? Is there a tide turning? Is it going to lead to some, you know, prosper in our in common sense? And if so, what is it? How would that happen? Uh, and if not, tell us why. Mm-hmm.